If you follow any self-help accounts on the socials, you've probably heard about shadow work. When it's done right, it can really change your life for the better. Unfortunately, most of the information out there is quite superficial. Contrary to popular belief, your shadow is not just all the stuff you hate about yourself. Likewise, integrating your shadow is not as easy as answering a few questions from a journal you bought off TikTok. So today, let's review what the shadow actually is using Jung's own words and talk about what shadow work actually looks like with an INFP and an ENFJ example. And to do this complex topic justice, we have to understand Jung's model of the psyche and his definitions first. If you're new here, my name is Doris. I'm a certified personality type coach with a master's in applied psychology, and I help smart romantics build meaningful relationships. Every epic story from Lord of the Rings to Game of Thrones starts with a map to help situate the audience. So to help you find your way to your shadow, our map is Jung's model of the psyche. Navigating this map will help you understand what the shadow is and what it means in relation to the other structures in your mind. Quick disclaimer up front, the map is not the territory. That means this model is an abstraction, and although you can experience these structures, you probably won't find them on an MRI. Okay, maybe there is one exception. According to Mark Soames, research suggests that consciousness sits in the parabrachial nuclei region in your brainstem. But generally speaking, we don't yet know how a physical thing like your brain produces mental things like experiences. So we'll just leave it at that. Just wanted to clarify that Jung's map of the psyche is a model, not actual precise brain regions. Starting at the top, the outer world refers to the physical things and people that exist outside of yourself. And the inner world is everything inside of yourself. Jung refers to anything outside of yourself as objects and you and anything pertaining to you as subjects. So keep that in mind as we go through his descriptions later on. Objects equal outer, subjects equal inner. Persona comes from the Greek word for masks that actors used to wear. And in this case, your persona is the behavior you adopt around others to interact with the outer world. Jung says, the persona is a complicated system of relations between individual consciousness and society, fittingly enough a kind of mask designed on the one hand to make a definite impression upon others and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. What goes on behind the mask is then called private life. This painfully familiar division of consciousness into two figures often preposterously different, is an incisive psychological operation that is bound to have repercussions on the unconscious. The construction of a collectively suitable persona means a formidable concession to the external world, a genuine self-sacrifice which drives the ego straight into identification with the persona so that people really do exist who believe they are what they pretend to be. The soullessness of such an attitude is, however, only apparent, for under no circumstances will the unconscious tolerate this shifting of the center of gravity. When we examine such cases critically, we find that the excellence of the mask is compensated by the private life going on behind it. Whoever builds up too good a persona for himself naturally has to pay for it with irritability. A man cannot get rid of himself in favor of an artificial personality without punishment. This description already covers a lot of the rest of the model, but it is pretty dense. The meaning of self-sacrifice and getting rid of the self in favor of a persona will become clearer when we get to the explanation of the self. And again, when we overlay the constellation of personality type on this map. The soullessness is only apparent, means you only think you can exclude your unconscious from your public life, but actually it's always there pulling strings. The external guidelines for personae can be found in cultural roles and expectations. For example, a lawyer and a doctor and a rock star and a scientist are all expected to look talk and behave in certain ways. If you put on a uniform for your job or makeup, that is part of your persona. As Jung warned, some people overly identify with their persona and become artificial. Internal characteristics of your persona will vary according to your personality type and past experiences, and people who overdo that and ignore societal expectations completely may be seen as troublemakers and outcasts. 
We can debate, of course, whether it's healthy to be adapted to a sick society another time. For now, suffice to say that for a balanced psyche, ideally your persona is a healthy mix of sharing who you actually are in your soul while respecting the cultural conventions as you interact with the outside world. Moving on, your persona is part of your ego, in Jung's words. By ego, I understand a complex of ideas which constitutes the center of my field of consciousness and appears to possess a high degree of continuity and identity. It is not identical with the totality of my psyche, being merely one complex among other complexes. I therefore distinguish between the ego and the self, since the ego is only the subject of my consciousness, while the self is the subject of my total psyche, which also includes the unconscious. Some things to unpack here. Jung's definition of a complex is an agglomeration of associations, so a heaping bundle of associations that can have traumatic, painful, or just strong characteristics that are difficult to handle. Finding it hard to handle something or dealing with something painful or traumatic also shows up in physiological reactions like an upset stomach or high blood pressure. Some people have a mother complex or a power complex or a diet and beauty complex, which can get triggered easily and make you feel out of sorts. As Jung puts it, because something that irritates my body cannot be easily pushed away, a complex with its given tension or energy has the tendency to form a little personality of itself. For instance, when you want to say or do something and unfortunately a complex interferes with this intention, then you say or do something different from what you intended. You are simply interrupted and your best intention gets upset by the complex exactly as if you had been interfered with by a human or by circumstances from outside. In other words, our ego is also a complex of vast amounts of associations, ever-changing and shifting, and a healthy ego consists of mostly positive and good associations. We use whatever content we have in our ego to describe who we are. It's the seat of our identity, including everything we like about ourselves. Our ego is our main point of reference for continuity in that we have memories with ourselves acting in them. And when something happens in the outer or inner world, our ego determines how we interpret what happened. Our ego also drives a lot of our motivation, our behavior, and what we think we deserve as a consequence of being who we are and doing what we do. We call someone egotistical when they overdo it and make everything about themselves. But as you can see from the map, while most of the ego is above the center line of consciousness, the ego also does reach into the unconscious area. That means there are also parts to your identity and other complexes with associations we are not aware of. And they're in the shadow. So let's keep going. We're almost there. We'll skip over the self for now because it's really the final piece at the center of it all, but we'll come back to it. For now, by consciousness, I understand the relation of psychic contents to the ego insofar as this relation is perceived as such by the ego. Relations to the ego that are not perceived as such are unconscious. Consciousness is not identical with the psyche because the psyche represents the totality of all psychic contents and these are not necessarily all directly connected with the ego, that is, relate to it in such a way that they take on a quality of consciousness. A great many psychic complexes exist which are not all necessarily connected with the ego. So we might say the ego is our reference point for who we are and consciousness is our ego's awareness and interpretation of what happens around us. Consciousness is you, awake, aware, and alert. To be conscious, you have to have perception. That's the ability to notice and process information. Perception is one way how the ego and consciousness influence one another, because your ego actually predisposes you to pay attention to some things more than others, which then creates certain conscious experiences more than others. That also means that consciousness or your ego are not in charge or not in the driver's seat all the time. Sometimes your unconscious takes over, like when you're asleep, or when you're doing something on autopilot, or when you're in the grip of a complex. We've covered that it feels like our unconscious has a mind of its own sometimes, because the complexes and their bodily connections move through us and we cannot always control them. But how does something become unconscious in the first place? 
In my view, the unconscious is a psychological borderline concept which covers all psychic contents or processes that are not related to the ego in any perceptible way. We know from experience that conscious contents can become unconscious through loss of their energy value. This is the normal process of forgetting. We also know that conscious contents can fall below the threshold of consciousness through intentional forgetting, or what Freud calls the repression of a painful content. A similar effect is produced by a dissociation of the personality, that is the disintegration of consciousness as a result of a violent affect or nervous shock, or through the collapse of the personality in schizophrenia. And Bloiler is the scientist there. We know from experience too that sense perceptions, which either because of their slight intensity or because of the deflection of attention, do not reach conscious apperception, nonetheless become psychic contents through unconscious apperception, which again may be demonstrated by hypnosis, for example. The same thing may happen with certain judgments or other associations. Finally, experience also teaches that there are unconscious psychic associations, mythological images, for instance, which have never been the object of consciousness and must therefore be wholly the product of unconscious activity. The range of what could be an unconscious content is simply illimitable. We can distinguish a personal unconscious comprising all the acquisitions of personal life, everything forgotten, repressed, subliminally perceived, thought and felt. But there are other contents which originate in the inherited possibility of psychic functioning in general, that is, the inherited structure of the brain. These are the mythological associations, the motifs and images that can spring up anew anytime, anywhere, independently of historical tradition or migration. I call these contents the collective unconscious. And just as conscious psychic activity creates certain products, so unconscious psychic activity produces dreams, fantasies, etc. The functional relation of the unconscious processes to consciousness may be described as compensatory, since experience shows that they bring to the surface the subliminal material that is constellated by the conscious situation, that is all those contents which could not be missing from the picture if everything were conscious. The compensatory function of the unconscious becomes more obvious the more one-sided the conscious attitude is. In other words, everyone has different levels of unconsciousness. The personal unconscious appears and develops as a natural counterpart to your ego and your persona. Just like your brain filters out gazillions of data points from your perception at any given time. For example, were you aware of the sensation in your left foot until I mentioned it just now? Your psyche is filtering data it considers good and important to your ego and everything else goes into the personal unconscious. The collective unconscious is there from the beginning and mainly comes through in mythical dream symbols. It contains archetypal characters and energies, which means everyone all over the world has access to them because they are symbolic. Although Jung places the shadow in the collective unconscious, it is the most easily accessible and easiest to experience for its nature can in large measure be inferred from the contents of the personal unconscious. Now we're getting to the meat of it. And to give us a break from the slides perhaps, I like to think of my unconscious like a backpack. It's full of stuff I put in there because I couldn't or didn't want to deal with it at the time. Other people added some of their stuff while I wasn't looking. Uh, and most of it was so long ago that I've forgotten what's even in there. But whenever I remember to take it off and go through its contents, I find trash that I no longer need or that wasn't mine and that I can throw away. Sometimes I also find a little gem that I can put in my front pocket for easier access. It's a very deep backpack. My shadow stuff is pretty easily accessible because it sits on top of my collective unconscious department. It's right by the personal unconscious and I can get to that one easily. And this is the first type or first kind of shadow work. I just have to ask people who spend a lot of time with me for feedback and listen to what they say. And then I can get to my personal shadow.
The other archetypal stuff is deeper down and my arm isn't long enough to reach. Either way, doing a periodic inventory lightens my load so I can move through the world with more ease when I put it back on again. And here's where, of course, the backpack isn't a perfect metaphor because you can't just take off your unconscious and leave it by the side of the road. Also, you can't actually look at what's in the shadow directly because the shadow is unconscious. So by definition, you cannot see the thing itself. You can only know that it is there when you feel the weight or when you remember or when you realize that it's become consciously aware that you are carrying something. And those times are usually triggered by something where you have a big visceral or negative emotional reaction. Whenever you get really sad, angry, stressed or jealous, remember Jung's famous and my favorite quote, everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. So whenever you get annoyed, pause and think, ah, there's something here I should look at. Why does it bother me so much that this person is doing this thing? A lot of stuff in our shadow backpack is stuff we learned is wrong or bad based on the cultural values in which we were raised. In the West, think of phrases like boys don't cry or good girls are quiet. What if you were a sensitive boy or a curious girl? If you received those messages growing up, you probably stuffed your tears and your questions into your backpack and put on the mask or persona of a tough guy and a good girl that allowed you to better interact with the outer world. And then you forgot about it until you grow up and you see a man cry at the birth of his child or a woman take charge in a business meeting and your shadow whispers, ill, get yourself together or ill, just shut up and sit down. You were told off as a child. Your psyche turned that into a complex ball of associations, put it in the shadow backpack and now you tell off other people for doing the same thing. But it's not all outer triggers. Sometimes your shadow also takes the wheel from within. It's usually when your psyche is so uncomfortably out of balance that it initiates countermeasures. Like Jung said before, we find that the excellent of the mask is compensated by the private life going on behind it. When ego consciousness is leaning too far to one side, ego unconsciousness like the shadow or anima and animus will push against to make up the difference and balance out the psyche again. Here we go. By shadow, I mean the negative side of personality, the sum of all those unpleasant qualities we like to hide, together with the insufficiently developed functions and the contents of the personal unconscious. Unfortunately, there can be no doubt that man is, on the whole, less good than he imagines himself or wants to be. Everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious, the blacker and denser it is. If the repressed tendencies, the shadow as I call them, were obviously evil, there would be no problem whatever. But the shadow is merely somewhat inferior, primitive, unadapted and awkward, not wholly bad. It even contains childish or primitive qualities, which would in a way vitalize and embellish human existence, but convention forbids. The shadow is a moral problem that challenges the whole ego personality. To become conscious of it involves recognizing the dark aspects of personality as present and real. This act is the essential condition for any kind of self-knowledge and it therefore, as a rule, meets with considerable resistance. Indeed, self-knowledge as a psychotherapeutic measure frequently requires much painstaking work extending over a long period. In other words, self-knowledge through years of reflection, processing feedback, self-awareness, self-acceptance, self-compassion, and sure, probably meditation and journaling can help you lighten your shadow. And yes, it's not all negative and also contains creative potential and positive aspects. But is it really worth to do all that work? Let's get to why you should bother. Although with insight and goodwill, the shadow can to some extent be assimilated into the conscious personality, experience shows that there are certain features which offer the most obstinate resistance to moral control and prove almost impossible to influence. These resistances are usually bound up with projections which are not recognized as such. 
No matter how obvious it may be to the neutral observer that it is a matter of projections, there is little hope that the subject will perceive this himself. The effect of projection is to isolate the subject from his environment, since instead of a real relation to it, there is now only an illusory one. Projections change the world into the replica of one's own unknown face. The more projections are thrust in between the subject and the environment, the harder it is for the ego to see through its illusions. The source of projections is no longer the shadow, which is always of the same sex as the subject, but the contrasexual figure. Here we meet the animas of a woman and the anima of a man, two corresponding archetypes whose autonomy and unconsciousness explain the stubbornness of their projections. Whereas the shadow can be seen through and recognized fairly easily, the anima and animus are much further away from consciousness. In other words, if you don't empty out your shadow backpack every once in a while, your anima and animus weight will not only drag you backwards, it'll also separate you from your ego consciousness and real life. You probably know someone who is, let's say, always dating the same kind of guy, it always ends the same kind of way, and they keep blaming their exes. Or maybe you have a friend who's had five different jobs in two years and it's always the boss's fault that they didn't get a promotion. Repeating life patterns are your unconsciousness's way of showing you there's a lesson to be learned here. And that's where we get to the second kind of shadow work. Start paying attention to your dreams. Jung wrote books on this, and I'm happy to review those in another video. But just in the context of your psyche, what we're talking about here is your shadow may be represented by someone with a darker skin color or dark clothing, and it will always be represented by someone of your same sex in your dreams, right? That's how you know it's your shadow. Your anima or animus will show up as someone of your opposite sex. Now, I'm afraid I'm not aware of a non-binary equivalent here, but if you are non-binary and you happen to be in Jungian analysis, please leave a comment or email me. I'd love to know how that shows up for you. Okay, it's time to circle back around to the self. And this is where Jung's personality model also gives us concrete language to describe what is happening in the psyche. In case you are not aware, Jung's personality theory is one of opposites, tension and balances. Your ego will have a preference for one or of one of two perception processes, sensing or intuiting, and one of two judging processes, thinking or feeling. All can be oriented to the outer or inner world, aka extroverted or introverted. By the time you're in your 20s, you develop a highly differentiated dominant function, and by definition, its opposite gets relegated and becomes an undifferentiated inferior function. Your dominant function is your ego consciousness, your inferior function is your anima if you're a man, or animus if you're a woman. To be clear, inferior functions are in no way morbid, but merely backward as compared with the favored function. Again, that's a naturally occurring part of ego development. In your first half of life, your ego and dominant function develop, differentiate and do all the things they're best at. But the more energy is spent on the ego, the more energy gets stored up in the anima or animus. And as we've seen, if left unchecked, eventually it might spill over. We've talked about external triggers where you might be projecting things you don't want to acknowledge in yourself onto others. Their behaviors trigger a complex you don't want to deal with, so you point the finger and say, but look at them, it's all their fault. But there are also internal triggers, and sometimes these are age-related. In your 20s, your shadow piping up thing might look like falling ill just because a big dissertation or a project is due, or right after you hand it in. For weeks, you put all your energy into thinking and making things and getting things done, and your inner voice, your unconscious, was probably whispering to rest and sleep, but you ignored it for so long that it made your body stop and rest by force. In your 30s, this might look like feeling desperately stuck in a job or marriage you hate, but keeping at it because you need the money to keep up with your neighbors and look successful. All the energy you're putting into your happily married persona or your successful manager persona is equally building up in your unconscious. So now your inner voice is shouting and you have to doom scroll social media and get high or drunk on the weekend to drown it out. In your 40s, your ego becomes aware that life is finite and you have a choice. Either double down on the persona piece and prepare for a psychotic break on the horizon, because let's face it, eventually the booze will get you, or start listening to that inner voice, face facts, and balance some things out. 
People call this a midlife crisis. Jung calls this the individuation process. A couple of things I do want to point out. Number one, Jung is one of the very few thinkers who also talked about adult psychological development. He was very clear that the second half of life is actually where it gets really interesting for us. And number two, Jung said having your life fall apart in this way or even you developing a neurosis can be a good thing. And I quote, in many cases we have to say thank heaven he could make up his mind to be neurotic. Neurosis is really an attempt at self-cure. It is an attempt of the self-regulating psychic system to restore the balance in no way different from the function of dreams, only rather more forceful and drastic. Individuation can take years and your inferior function will never reach the same level of differentiation as your dominant. But the result, or better, the reward of bringing some of your conscious attention away from your ego into your shadow, the continual balancing of psychic energy between ego and anima, persona and shadow, listening to feedback and accepting negative judgments about yourself, admitting that you too make mistakes and that you can learn from them, that it's okay to be human and fallible, that reward is an integrated self. The self expresses the unity of the personality as a whole. It encompasses both the experienceable and the inexperienceable or the not yet experienced. It is a transcendental concept for it presupposes the existence of unconscious factors on empirical grounds and thus characterizes an entity that can be described only in part but for the other part remains present, unknowable and illimitable. The self as psychic totality also has a conscious as well as an unconscious aspect. Empirically, the self appears in dreams, myths and fairy tales in the figure of the supraordinate personality, such as a king, hero, prophet, savior, etc. Or in the form of a totality symbol, such as the circle, square, cross, etc. It can also appear as a united duality in the form, for instance, of Tao as the interplay of Yang and Yin. The self appears as a play of light and shadow, although conceived as a totality and unity in which the opposites are united. This is what Jung meant with self-sacrifice and forgetting yourself just to build this big persona of someone healthy, wealthy and happy. Social media, I think, is a great example of persona gone awry. Countless studies show that fake it till you make it is actually harmful to your psyche and leads to depression and anxiety. Of course, we all need a persona, and we are all entitled to our private lives behind the mask. But if we continually pretend to be someone we are not, if we force ourselves into a mask for society and ignore our inner voice, our soul, we will become psychologically ill. Our ego and conscious will lose control, our complexes and unconscious will take over, and our lives may not be ruined, I hope they're not, but years will be wasted chasing something out there that's already in here, just waiting to be acknowledged. There's one word that's not on the map and that we haven't explained yet, and that is soul. Unfortunately, here's where we get into a tricky bit of translation because Jung's original texts were, of course, in German. And he used the word anima to describe the feminine unconscious aspects of man, but the English translation substituted anima for several mentions of Seele, which is soul in German. And I've put those in brackets. By soul, on the other hand, I understand a clearly demarcated functional complex that can be best described as a personality. I call the outer attitude the outward face, the persona. The inner attitude, the inward face, I call the anima. As to the character of the soul, my experience confirms the rule that it is by and large complementary to the character of the persona. If the persona is intellectual, the soul will quite certainly be sentimental. The complementary character of the soul also affects the sexual character, as I have proved to myself beyond doubt. A very feminine woman has a masculine soul, and a very masculine man has a feminine soul. Again, complementing and compensating is used in the sense of restoring balance and self-curing what may be out of balance. Now that you have a deeper understanding of the processes of your psyche, we can turn to the personality types as an example of how cognitive functions map to these structures. For INFP types, the map looks like this. The ego has the introverted feeling, or FI, and the anima animus has extroverted thinking, or TE. 
If this individual is in the United States, their persona is most likely extroverted because Americans value people who speak up and who are outgoing. But for whatever the culture is, the auxiliary function, the second one for INFP types, is extroverted intuiting or NE, which is about pattern recognition, brainstorming ideas and seeing opportunities. It's how INFP types like to be helpful to others, sharing enthusiasm and celebrating potential. Any other persona characteristics would depend on the job they have, the partner they're with, the complexes they're masking, their upbringing, right, etc. INFP types ego consciousness revolves around introverted feeling. I've shared videos about the different flavors of introverted feeling before, I'll put those links in the description. But in Jung's words, just as a refresher, introverted feeling seldom appears on the surface and is generally misunderstood. It is continually seeking an image which has no existence in reality, but which it has seen in a kind of vision. It glides unheedingly over all objects that do not fit within its aim. It strives after inner intensity. The depth of this feeling can only be guessed. It can never be clearly grasped. It makes people silent and difficult of access. It comes out with negative judgments or assumes an air of profound indifference as a means of defense. Strengths of introverted feeling are active listening and paying attention to nonverbal cues, a strong inner value system and moral compass, and loyalty to a greater cause. So the introverted feeling ego is driven to be authentic, it likes to experience deep emotions, it quickly judges between likes, dislikes, good, bad, yes, no, and that means the perception of FI ego content will be focused on values, ethics, and vibes. With those strengths also come some blind spots, and they include ignoring whatever doesn't fit in with their belief system, not registering specific numbers or detailed data points, jumping into causes or relationships that feel good without doing due diligence checks, and generally depending on their heart and or guts without consulting the head or any proven analytic system. So what could this look like in practice? Let's say an INFP woman is working in an office environment, in her 20s, she might just feel stressed a lot with office politics. She might also quietly judge her ESTJ boss or pity him for being cold and mechanical and colorless and gray and unimaginative. Although she doesn't really judge anyone because, you know, everyone has to live their truth. In her 30s, she might still secretly think her life is better than that of her boss because she feels oriented to something bigger and more profound, while the boss is just out for status and promotions. She lives her life fully and experiences all emotions fully. Yes, that's a bit of a roller coaster sometimes, but that's how you know you're alive. In her 40s, she might have had a few feedback rounds where colleagues said that she had her head in the clouds and was unreliable sometimes. After talking with some down to earth friends, she might be realizing that maybe playing it by the book and getting that promotion and raise would have been helpful because her retirement funds are actually looking pretty slim. She started to feel motivated to do something about it because her animus, the inferior extroverted thinking, is pushing her to start thinking practically, get organized and get things done. Or let's say our INFP is an artist in his 20s, fresh out of college, with big ideas about making music true to his soul. He plays small gigs and cozy clubs. He did the artist's way and lets the universe compose through him. In his 30s, he starts having the occasional dream of a guy dressed in black leather, leaning on the hood of a black limousine, trying to get him to sign with the dubious record label. He feels a bit funny when he wakes up, but then he remembers his loyal following and everything is fine. In his 40s, he has nightmares of a woman in a power suit who's bossing him around. When he wakes up, he processes those dreams into his journal and is probably going to use the insights for song lyrics. But yes, his inferior extroverted thinking anima is telling him to realize that making money with your art is not the same as selling out. These INFP friends have started their shadow work. They've listened to feedback and taken it on board. They've started paying attention to their dreams and journaling about them. Now here are two more kinds of shadow work that they and you might consider. Active imagination and working with a professional. Active imagination, in the Jungian sense, is not fantasizing, but active and purposeful creation to explore your psyche. 
A fantasy is more or less your own invention and remains on the surface of personal things and conscious expectations. But active imagination, as the term denotes, means that the images have a life of their own and that the symbolic events develop according to their own logic. That is, of course, if your conscious reason doesn't interfere. You begin by concentrating upon a starting point. When you concentrate on the mental picture, it begins to stir. The image becomes enriched by details. It moves and develops. Each time, naturally, you mistrust it, but you have to overcome that doubt. We can really produce precious little by our conscious mind. All the time we are dependent upon the things that literally fall into our consciousness. Therefore, in German, we call them Einfälle. We depend entirely upon the benevolent cooperation of our unconscious. If it does not cooperate, we are completely lost. And so, when we concentrate on an inner picture and when we are careful not to interrupt the natural flow of events, our unconscious will produce a series of images which make a complete story. Since by active imagination all the material is produced in a conscious state of mind, the material is far more rounded out than the dreams with their precarious language. And it contains much more than dreams do. For instance, the feeling values are in it and one can judge it by feeling. You can record your active imagination through writing, painting, drawing, weaving, dancing, or really any other form you feel drawn to. How many of these do you have to do? Well, in his books, Jung gives examples of patients with whom he's analyzed hundreds of paintings each, and one particular university man who recorded 1,300 dreams in detail, and after working through them was completely cured from his alcohol and anger issues. From my experience, active imagination is actually quite tricky. I never know whether my imaginations are fantasy, like Jung said, or wishful thinking, or projections from my introverted intuition. I have ENFJ preferences, so introverted intuiting, or NI, is my second preferred function, which is also called the auxiliary. The auxiliary develops alongside the dominant and carries an archetypal energy of good parent or supportive friend. I think our second fu function forms part of our persona because it's how we are trying to be helpful to others, which includes how we, in part, interact with the outer world. My ego or consciousness function is extroverted feeling, or FE, which is about harmony and connecting with others. So I pride myself in paying attention to and understanding others and maintaining good relationships with friends and family. My perception is focused on how others are feeling and making sure they're okay. This often includes changing my own behavior to help them be okay, which in turn calms my own nervous system down again. A lot of extroverted feeling shadow work, therefore, is learning to keep boundaries between what is my responsibility and what isn't mine to fix, because it belongs to others. My inferior animus is introverted thinking, or TI, which is about analyzing and coming up with universal truths. In a way, a lot of this work I'm doing here that consists of reading, learning, integrating, with what I know empirically from my own lived experience and applying it to Jung's model is me acting from my inferior function. If I spend too much time here, my psyche will be out of balance toward my inner world. I'll get irritable and feel like I'm going around in circles. The Spanish actually have a saying for this. It's comerse el coco, literally eating your own brain with obsessive thinking. I try to remedy that in the first instance by going outside and taking walks which satisfies my third function, extroverted sensing, but also by mindfully applying what I've learned to relationships, which is the focus of my dominant function. And of course, by sharing these things here with you in the hope you might find them helpful, which is a mix of FE and NI for me. I've described mostly examples of small p problems and obviously one video cannot cover all the bases. So depending on how stuck you feel or how out of balance your psyche might be, do consider getting professional help. That can be a personality coach like myself, or if you feel like you're having big P problems, a Jungian analyst or psychotherapist will be able to help you. Remember that whatever uncomfortable energy forces or imbalance you're experiencing, it's your psyche trying to self-correct and self-cure. Your mind wants to get better. Now that you know about this map and how your personality type is expressed through it, you can avoid getting into deeper trouble. You can get unstuck. You can learn the skills to shine your own torch into your own shadow and enjoy a balanced, united self. Leave a comment if you found this helpful or if you'd like to share how any of this shows up for you.
as always, if you've liked this video, you're probably going to enjoy this next one as well. And I'll see you there.